Can I start firstly by introducing myself? My name is Steve O'Reilly, for those who don't know me. Um, I'm a partner in the major projects and construction group at Clayton Utes, uh, their Melbourne office. I'm also the chair of the board at Clayton Utes and the joint head of our international arbitration group at Clayton Utes. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the 2018 Clayton Utes and University of Sydney International Arbitration Lecture. Yes, I said University of Sydney. Um, it's, it's a long history that we've had um, doing this lecture on an annual ba basis together with the University of Sydney, um, what is now the, the 17th year of this lecture and the first time for it to be held uh, in Melbourne. Um, we're delighted to hold it in Melbourne because it's, we do so in conjunction with Arbitration Week that's happening here uh, this week and we're delighted to put on the show for our speaker with some classic uh, Melbourne weather, which is, he assured me, is not a patch on the weather they see in winter in Sweden. Um, I'm pleased to be joined today by Professor Chester Brown. Um, Chester is a Professor of International Law and International Arbitration at the University of Sydney and our speaker this evening, uh, Robin Oldenstam. Uh, Robin joins us from Mannheimer Svartling in Sweden where he is a partner specialising in arbitration and civil litigation. Um, he also chairs his firm's dispute resolution group. He is the current Swedish member of the ICC International Court of Arbitration. Um, between 2010 and 2014, Robin chaired the Swedish Arbitration Association, which is the leading association for arbitration practitioners in Sweden. Um, Robin's very active in the field of international arbitration and has acted as counsel in numerous arbitrations uh, under rules including Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, which I'm sure you're all familiar with those rules, um, ICC, ONSA trial, Swiss rules and various other rules and procedures used internationally including in ad hoc proceedings. Um, his area of practice is quite diverse, a uh, range of areas and industries including oil and gas, M&A, licensing, sale of goods, construction and finance. Um, Robin's also got considerable expertise not just as an advocate or counsel in arbitrations but also as an arbitrator. Um, many appointments both as sole arbitrator and chair in both domestics domestic and international arbitrations seated in Sweden and around the world. Um, he's a fellow of the Institute, of Ch sorry, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Um, he's responsible, heavy onus, responsible for the Swedish Bars Association mandatory course in trial advocacy, uh, regularly lectures in arbitration and litigation at many university courses and trainings for, training for professionals. Uh, he is the main author of Mannheimer Svartling's Guide to Commercial Dispute Resolution and the Swedish uh, chapter of Practitioner's Handbook on International Commercial Arbitration, as well as various articles and case notes in professional journals. He's also a member of the editorial board for Global Arbitration Review. Not sure what he does in his spare time. Um, this evening we're delighted uh, that Robin has joined us to speak on the need for speed. Is international arbitration becoming overly fixated with efficiency? Uh, while we all recognise that efficiency is an important factor in arbitration and a likely key to its long-term survival as a favoured form of resolving international commercial disputes, um, at the same time efficiency needs to be tempered by basic procedural principles such as party autonomy, and due process, as well as by general considerations of fairness. Uh, recent years have seen a drive towards pushing efficiency as far as could possibly go, and to the extent that it may start to infringe upon some of these princ the principles that I've just mentioned is something that Robin's going to consider for us this evening. Um, on behalf of Clayton Newts and the University of Sydney, uh, please join me in welcoming Robert Robin. Well, thank you, Stephen, for all those uh, kind words. Um, 
you shouldn't take all of that he said too seriously. I was actually reminded the other day of that when I got an email from an American magazine, a rag called the Lawyers Monthly, telling me that I'd been voted uh, Arbitral Woman of the Year in Sweden. <laughs> and uh, of course I was delighted and accepted and I even ordered the tombstone, so I've got this ghastly glass thing now standing on my table telling the world that I am Arbitral Woman of the Year in Sweden. <laughs> Obviously the American had done no research and just assumed that Robin, of course, was, is a woman. Uh, that just goes to show. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me first express my gratitude of being invited by Clayton Oates and the University of, of Sydney to hold this lecture and address you all this evening. Uh, it's also my first time in your country, and it's been lovely so far. This weather does not change that. Uh, if you've been in Sweden, you would know why. My uh, topic of choice is the need for speed. Is arbitration becoming overly fixated with efficiency. Uh, as you will know, efficiency is often cited as one of the main advantages of uh, arbitration over court litigation. Court litigation, of course, being highly regulated, often with one or several layers of appeal, arbitration being hardly regulated at all, and of course being a one-stop shop uh, uh, provides a lot of gains in time and cost. And business, of course, often need to have their disputes resolved sooner rather than later. They need that because they need legal certainty. They need to know what their position is so they can plan ahead. And they also rather grow their business than spend time in courtrooms or, or in uh, uh, arbitration venues. And for international commercial arbitration to maintain its attractiveness, of course, it needs to cater for these needs of, of business. No doubt about that. Now, I've been an arbitration lawyer for over 20 years, and during all my time, there's been a debate going on amongst our clients and users about the time and cost of arbitration. Uh, so nothing new there. And speaking to older colleagues, it's clear that that discussion dates back much longer than just 20 years. It may even date back as long as, as arbitration has been around at all. However, it seems to me that the focus on efficiency as to time and cost have gained increasing focus and sometimes even singular focus in recent years. In this respect, of course, arbitration is really only following a much larger global trend where things need to go faster and be cheaper all the time. Since its origins, International commercial arbitration has changed into a global professional <coughs> industry. As part of that development, it seems to me that every other country now is developing a modern arbitration law and also setting up one or more institutes uh, to try to gain the business, not only in that country but in the surrounding region. As a result, of course, and over time, competition between arbitration seats and arbitration institutions are constantly increasing. And in trying to attract users and grow their business, they need to improve their offer constantly. A large, if not even predominant part of that effort and that offer is trying to limit the time and cost of bringing a claim to arbitration. By way of example, very recently my own government introduced changes to the Swedish Arbitration Act, the majority of which I would say are geared towards achieving efficiency. For instance, by limiting the time that a party has to challenge an award from currently three months to two months. That's just an example. There are many other provisions in, in the draft. Uh, institutions, of course, are taking similar measures, but much more often. They revise their rules every two, three years, looking at other institutions, looking at what's happening in the world, trying to keep ahead of everyone else. And they will, uh, a large part of their efforts in revising their rules will be to make them more efficient. Um, if you look at the most recent revisions of the ICC rules, the LCIA rules, the SCC rules, which were uh, uh, changed as, as late as 1st January 2017, you can see that the bulk of what's happening is geared towards efficiency. Efficiency is pervading more or less every step of the procedure trying to make it quicker and, and perhaps cheaper. Not that the institutions are lowering their fees, that's not happening, but they're trying to make uh, uh, the council cost less, I, I assume. 
Uh, in addition, you'll also see that most legal institutions are now regularly uh, providing statistics over the time and cost it takes to bring a claim. Uh, and this, of course, uh, is helpful to them. They can measure, they can compare, and they can make it part of their marketing. You also find them to monitor arbitrators. Uh, the ICC, for instance, are monitoring arbitrators to make sure that they're efficient. And if they're not, if the ICC <coughs> believes that they are too slow in rendering a, a draft award for scrutiny, the arbitrators may be penalised in having their fees lowered. But if they're quick, well, they may be rewarded by having their fees slightly uh, elevated. Now, overall, I believe that this global trend and all of these efforts are beneficial. International arbitration cannot be sheltered from the rest of the world. It needs to follow suit with all the developments we see globally. Um, and it needs to be sure that time and costs are kept at an efficient level in order to maintain its attractiveness as the preferred choice for settling cross-border commercial disputes. However, with this increasing and sometimes quite singular focus on time and cost, other principles and values may not always get the attention they deserve. Even though efficiency is important and sometimes even critical, international arbitration cannot only be about resolving a dispute in the most cost and time efficient manner. It needs also to observe fundamental principles, party autonomy, due process, but also look to other values such as the value of having a common framework around the world, which we see with the IBA guidelines on conflicts, on the IBA rules and so forth, that's all helpful. And also I think other values that I would submit are important, such as broader concepts of fairness, broader concepts of long-term risk management around the arbitral process. Although it doesn't necessarily have to be so, there is something of an inherent tension between, on the one hand, efficiencies to time and cost, and on the other hand, those other principles and values. I think that needs to be recognised, and it's a question of balancing the two. Efficiency, as a time and cost, of course, also manifests itself in hard facts. It can be measured, it can be compared. Principles, such as due process, um, fairness, uh, especially fairness and those kinds of, let's say, less tangible values are inherently difficult to measure and compare. And you may not even think much about them until you find that they're gone, until you find that you've been deprived somehow. An unfortunate side effect of this is that efficiency as to time and cost often and easily gain most of the focus and the attention, whilst other principles and values may slowly start to become somewhat eroded or be overlooked without anyone really noticing, at least not at first. I will go on to give you three examples um, which I consider relevant as indicators of this development or, if you wish, signs of our time. I should say outright that I do not consider any of these examples to represent clear-cut infringements of fundamental principles of arbitration, and there are aspects of them that may even be beneficial, for sure. However, the common theme for all three is that they are almost singularly driven by efficiency as the underlying factor. They are otherwise quite disparate, but that is the common theme of them all. And they all raise questions I submit, as to how far we should really allow efficiency to guide our choices in international arbitration and what other values may potentially be sacrificed on the way. My first concept is the concept of due process paranoia. Now, I do not know who coined that phrase, but it's become very <coughs> popular since it was coined. Uh, due process paranoia you will know, or at least I will explain to you, is uh, the idea that uh, arbitrators are generally harboring exaggerated fears of their awards being successfully challenged on the basis of a party <coughs> not having been given the chance to fully present its case. And arbitrators supposedly suffering 
from these paranoid tendencies, they will lack decisiveness. They will show an exaggerated generosity in procedural decisions, resulting in increased time and cost of arbitrations. Uh, for example, you will have arbitrators that are, uh, have, are suffering from due process paranoia, and they will be overly generous in granting uh, production of documents, in allowing untimely uh, submission of additional evidence or claims or uh, 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 submissions. Uh, this concept, again, and I don't know who, who originally introduced it, really got traction after the 2015 uh, International Arbitration Survey by the Queen Mary University of London. Um, in that survey, it was found that due process paranoia was a growing concern among many users of uh, international arbitration. And since then, it's been debated at many conferences. There's been articles written about this. There's been a lot of discussion on arbitration blogs and the like. And from that debate, two things have really emerged. First, it's been recognized that from a strict legal perspective, due process may only really be infringed if a tribunal severely misuses its procedural discretion. So it's a very high threshold before you can say that you've abused someone's due process rights. And the result of this is that for the majority of procedural decision, there is what has been called a safe harbor where uh, one cannot say that they infringe on due process rights. So that should be a comforting thought. Second, uh, there have been statistics uh, shown, at least for arbitration-friendly jurisdictions, demonstrating that it's very rare, in fact, for procedural irregularity to be a successful basis for a challenge. Again, something that arbitrators, at least those operating in arbitration-friendly jurisdiction, can take some comfort in. Uh, for my own jurisdiction, for instance, I've noted that uh, procedural irregularity is the most popular basis to be invoked by parties who want to attack an award, uh, but it's never, ever been successful before the Court of Appeals in Stockholm. Other bases have, but not that one. Uh, overall, again, I think that the debate over due process paranoia has been healthy. Uh, indeed, it ha may have persuaded some overly cautious arbitrators to take a bit more firm uh, case management, uh, 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 and that's all good, I think. However, I still find part of that debate troubling, and that goes back to the fact that it's been so much focused only on efficiency. The parts I've found troubling is that it's been overly simplistic. First, in that it's just assumed the correctness of this diagnosis. There's never been much of a debate around, well, is this really correct? Is this the most obvious explanation for what parties perceive to be overly generous procedural decisions? I would submit that it's not. It has then focused on these outer boundaries uh, of when a procedural decision may infringe upon due process. And it's sort of said that, well, save for overstepping that very high threshold, going beyond that very uh, uh, far away boundary, you should really, as an arbitrator, focus on efficiency. That should be your main focus, because that's what the parties want. It's also given rise to something of a vulgar undercurrent, where it's been a little bit too easy to brandish uh, arbitrators as suffering from due process paranoia as soon as a party believes that they've been overly generous on a procedural matter towards the opposing party. Although, as I said before, I think it's been generally helpful, and I have no doubt that some arbitrators do have exaggerated ideas of the risk of challenges, I question the general applicability of this diagnosis to the majority of procedural decisions where a tribunal may perhaps appear to be overly generous. There may, I would submit, in many cases be a differential diagnosis, which is simply prudence. And the reason why I'm saying this is that I believe that if you take a broader view on fairness and on long-term risk management, you can see that there may be causes sometimes to be a bit more generous. 
and the parties may not fully appreciate this. For those of you who've been judges or sitting as arbitrators, you will know that procedural decision making is a delicate balancing act. It is not easy. It also often comes without much detail when it comes to uh, the way of reasoning. Uh, if you take production of documents and if you do international arbitration, you will know that often you only have a Redfern schedule and in the last column the, the tribunal simply writes granted. That's all you get. You may get a little bit of reasoning on the side, but not much. And even in those cases where you get some reasoning, it will very seldom set out the full uh, reasoning and considerations by the tribunal. In particular, these reasons will typically not fully reflect the tribunal's broader long-term risk management. And often the tribunal has done such risk management with a particular view to the party that they may perhaps perceive may be losing this arbitration by the end of the road. Among those considerations taken by some arbitrators, and I should say that I'm one of those, but rarely if ever explained to the parties, include the following five. First, on a very general note, as I said at the beginning, arbitration is a one-stop shop. It's one of its benefits, but it also means that you won't get a chance to argue your case before a second higher authority. Given that limitation, I think it is incumbent on arbitrators to give parties a reasonable chance to have their full day in court, especially for the losing party to feel that he or she wasn't unnecessarily prevented or curtailed in presenting its case. Second, a losing party, and typically you have a losing party, will almost inevitably feel some level of dissatisfaction with that outcome. It's pretty obvious. And this substantive dissatisfaction, I would say, becomes even worse if it's coupled with a procedural dissatisfaction. If a losing party is left believing that he or she might have won, had they only been allowed to present that final submission, had they only been allowed to introduce that late witness, which they thought was timely under the circumstances. If a losing party is left with that feeling, well, that losing party is probably much more prone to go on and launch a challenge against the award. In light of this, I believe that it's rational for arbitrators to try to make the, let's say, potentially losing party, if not substantively, so at least procedurally, satisfied. It makes sense, all things being equal. And to cater for this, you may find that some arbitrators, once they start getting a feeling for where a case may be headed, they may tend to be a bit more generous to the party that may potentially end up losing when it comes to procedural matters. Third, even if you accept the statistics from arbitration-friendly jurisdictions that the risk of a successful challenge is a low risk, if that low risk materialises, it can be devastating, of course. It can make the entire investment of time and cost in the arbitration absolutely useless. Affording the losing party some procedural generosity may be a small price to pay, if that can reduce that risk. It may be comparable to paying a small insurance premium against a highly unlikely but devastating event. We do that all the time. We insure our homes against unlikely things like, like fire. We accept that. Fourth, even if you simply assume that whatever challenge is being launched afterwards is likely to be unsuccessful, so you're not afraid of a successful challenge, it still makes sense to avoid it altogether. Because what happens if you're the winner of an arbitration, if the losing party challenges your reward? Well, two things. One, of course, is that it introduces uncertainty about the continued validity of your reward uh, whilst that challenge proceeding is ongoing. And second, it forces you to defend the award and you will have to invest substantial amounts of money in legal costs as a party to defend the award. 
At the end of this, and this may take many months or even years, depending on the seat where the challenge is made, you may not recover all those costs. In some jurisdictions, you don't recover your costs, at least not in full, before the courts. And even if you do recover, you may not be able to enforce a cost order. Let's take my own jurisdiction, Sweden. Parties come to Sweden as a neutral venue. Many of the parties do not have any business, do not have any assets in Sweden. So what if you then win your challenge before the Svea Court of Appeal? You stand there with a full cost order. Well, you need to get that enforced in some other country. That may not be so easy. Court judgments are not as transportable as arbitration awards are under the New York Convention. There are a lot of limitations on where you can get that kind of court order enforced. And fifth, the risk, of course, of successful challenges or the risk of successful refusals of enforcement will vary between different jurisdictions. Most of the statistics that have been invoked are about arbitration-friendly jurisdictions, but not all jurisdictions are arbitration-friendly. I live in a part of the world with Russia and CIS countries where the arbitration friendliness do vary quite a bit. As arbitrator, you need to take that into account, that you may end up before court in a country where they're not particularly arbitration friendly and you don't want to give them the opportunity to decline to enforce the award because of some petty thing that you uh, uh, resisted when it came to, let's say, uh, additional evidence. At least it's something you will consider. Now, these factors are not exhaustive, and you always need to balance them against other factors, including, of course, time and cost. But if you take them into account, you may realize that the short-term addition of some time and cost from a generous procedural decision may well outweigh, uh, be outweighed by a long-term reduction of risk for even greater losses and time. And furthermore, of course, if the party uh, uh, who is dissatisfied with this procedural decision being too generous, if that party ultimately wins the arbitration, well, at least you can compensate that party for the added cost of that generosity by ordering them full compensation for their legal costs. What I'm saying is that if you take all these accounts, and it will, of course, vary between uh, one circumstance to the next, you may well end up in situations where the same you know, superficial circumstances can lead you to assume that this is uh, due process paranoia, but it may well just be prudence. And of course, on top of this, one should remember that procedural decision-making is inherently human. Not two arbitrators will have the same mindset, the same experiences, the same preferences. And of course, the same is true for the parties. One party may well think that a particular decision is uh, too generous. The other party may think it's just right or too firm. The same circumstances. It may just come down to individual perspective and experience. My overall conclusion on the debate on due process paranoia is that this singular focus on efficiency, and particularly short-term efficiency, may lead to short-sightedness when it comes to risks and cost, and it may lead parties to sometimes confuse an arbitrator's prudence for paranoia. Moving on to my second example, it is something called the Prague Rule. Now, what are the Prague Rules? Well, you'll be familiar, I, I would assume, most of you, with the IBA rules on the taking of evidence. Uh, they were introduced in their latest form in 2010. There is an older form, I think, from 2004. They've been hugely successful in creating a common framework around the world for the taking of evidence, including production of documents. And the reason, of course, why they've been so successful is that they strike a very good balance, a compromise between common law and civil law systems. As a US lawyer, you don't get full-blown discovery. As a civil law lawyer, perhaps from Germany, you get a bit more production than you would perhaps in your court rules. But still, the balance is acceptable to both camps. And it's been generally heralded as a big thing in arbitration that you have this. It also saves time and cost, because what you'll find is that parties 
are ready to adopt it without much discussion at the beginning of an arbitration. So this caters for efficiency. It has value. Up comes a contender, the Prague rules. What are the Prague rules? Well, at the moment, they are merely draft rules. They are going to be adopted uh, in Prague, hence the rule, uh, hence the name, later this year. As you can see, uh, they promote themselves as the rules on the efficient conduct of proceedings in international arbitration. Again, you see the recurrent theme of efficiency. So, why have they come about? Well, the authors are a group of predominantly Russian lawyers and lawyers in neighbouring East European countries. Now, these are countries where, before the local courts, they've been a tradition of taking an inquisitorial rather than adversarial approach. So you'll have the judge deciding what evidence to, to uh, uh, acknowledge or not, the judge to be the driving force in assessing the facts, uh, and generally a scepticism against oral arguments and all witnesses. So they prefer a written procedure. Now, inspired by these uh, uh, inquisitorial system, they come up with these rules. And if we take a little bit of a look at what the rules would entail, for production of documents, if you uh, are familiar with the IBA rules, you'll know that they allow you to ask for a reasonably defined but still category of documents. You don't need to specify the particular document. It's enough that you can, with some accuracy, say, you know, it's correspondence between X and Y in this period relating to this uh, uh, particular subject matter, and it can be by letter, email, or whatever other form. That would typically be sufficient, if you can persuade the arbitrators that this is relevant and material. It will not be sufficient under the draft Prague rules. You will need to specify the particular document in question. Essentially, that means that you need to know what you're asking for, specifically. This, I would submit, will be a major hamstring on production of documents and leave a party that needs to prove its case based on documents held by the other side in a very difficult situation. Second example, witnesses of fact. Well, the Prague Rules takes a restrictive approach to witnesses of fact. Um, it says that it is for the tribunal to decide which witnesses of fact will be heard. Effectively, this means that you can submit witness statements for all witnesses, but then the tribunal will decide. Uh, typically, under the IBA rules, the party, the opposing party, is asked, do you want to cross-examine this witness? Do you want this witness to be called for cross-examination? And then you say yes, and then you get the opportunity to challenge that witness, the testimony of that witness statement through cross-examination. Here, you're not assured of that right. The tribunal may think, ah, no, we already have so many witnesses saying the thing, same thing, or we're already convinced about those facts, or oh, we don't believe him or her anyway. Whatever reason, they may say no. No, we're not going to hear that witness, but we'll still allow the witness stand, the statement to stand. That, again, is a huge difference. Tribunal-appointed experts, again, coming out of this inquisitorial approach, the Prague rules, assume that you will not have party-appointed experts. It doesn't prohibit it, but it assumes that experts will be appointed by the tribunal. The idea, of course, being that you only then need one uh, uh, expert for each topic, and that that expert can be truly independent because it's he or she's been appointed by the tribunal. Now, I don't know how many of you have experienced uh, tribunal appointed experts. I have on a few occasions. It's not been a very good experience, I would say, because what happens, of course, is that in theory it sounds great, in practice it's really difficult. You will end up having big arguments over what, uh, what expert to engage. Because the experts come from different schools of thoughts, and some are beneficial and some are not, to the particular case you're advancing. Then you start debating, of course, the instructions and the questions. What information, what material is to be put to uh, uh, these experts? 
and the risk because you can't engage with them in a normal way that they simply misunderstand uh, 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 the real issue. You also end up typically having to engage your own experts anyway because you need them to phrase the questions right, to be sure that the material is the right one and to perhaps challenge, rebut or supplement whatever comes out of this tribunal appointed expert. So the end result is something even more expensive. I don't think this is a good idea. Hearings, again, based on this underlying inquisitorial approach, uh, if appropriate, and unless, of course, the Lex Arbitrary demands that you get a hearing, uh, the idea is that you do documents only. You don't have oral arguments, you don't hear witnesses. None of this is mandatory. Um, first of all, you don't have to adopt these rules. If you adopt them, I'm sure you can make uh, changes to them and whatever. But this is sort of the theme of them. And I think the examples I've shown you clearly demonstrate that they are different from the IBA rules. Well, as you may have guessed, I'm not a fan of these rules. Um, I believe they should be resisted. And again, I think they're coming out of this idea of promoting efficiency, but they are really doing something else and sacrificing something else that is more valuable whilst doing that. First, of course, it risks leading us back to a situation where we don't have this common framework anymore. We will need to have big debates between council at the outset of every arbitration which particular set of rules are we going to be guided by and if so, uh, uh, which parts. All that will, will go against efficiency, I would say, and also make arbitrations less foreseeable. Secondly, if indeed document production and the hearing of fact witnesses and, and party appointed experts add substantially and perhaps too much sometimes to the time and cost of arbitrations, I would say that's not the fault of the IBA rules. That's the fault of parties, and particularly arbitrators, for not sufficiently planning and managing the process. That's when you typically see that it goes south, and you end up with protracted uh, situations adding unnecessary costs. So the problem I would submit is not the IBA rules, and the remedy is certainly not the Prague rules. Third, I believe that some added time and cost may perhaps be the price we simply have to pay for an adversarial process, a process which I believe is better equipped to actually bring out uh, the full case and, more importantly, to leave the losing party feeling that he or she weren't curtailed, weren't prevented from putting its full case to the arbitrators. My third example is the ICC expedited uh, rules. Now, before I embark on this, I should say, and I think Steve mentioned that, I'm a proud member of the ICC court. I also believe that the ICC is a very good institution, perhaps the global leader, and I also believe that the rules are very good. I'm happy to, to refer to them in arbitration clauses. That doesn't mean that I cannot be critical of some aspect of the rules, same as I could be critical of any rules. There is always something that you can find to be critical about. And in this case, I'm a little bit critical about the ICC expedited procedure that came into force on the 1st of March last year, i.e. 1st of March 2017. Now, the idea, of course, with expedited procedure, as you will appreciate, is again efficiency. You have the ordinary rules and then you try to change them in some way to benefit efficiency, to drive down time and cost. Now, typically, institutes will have expedited rules. The SAA, uh, SCC has got expedited rules, uh, many other institutions. But the way they typically go about that is that they leave it for the parties to choose. If you go to the SEC website, you'll see you can choose the ordinary rules or you can make a, a choice to directly refer to the expedited rules. You have this choice as a party. You know what you're getting into. It's your choice. The ICC is taking a different approach to this. They decided that, no, 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 you just refer to the ordinary rules. And if you make this reference in your arbitration clause after 1st of March 2017, i.e. when these 
uh, expedited procedure had come into force, they automatically apply if the dispute, which of course you may not even have contemplated at the time you wrote the arbitration agreement, if that dispute comes out being at a value under a certain threshold. So when you write the clause, you're probably quite ignorant about all this. You just refer to the ICC rules. You happen to make that clause after the 1st of March 2017. Then you happen to have a dispute where the value is, let's say, 1.9 million, which, because the threshold is $2 million. Then you're in the expedited procedure. Surprise. Now, the big thing about these, which do make me hesitate a little bit, is that what they say is that if they apply, if you have these circumstances, and that's what I've highlighted in yellow there, it says, by agreeing to arbitration under the rules, the parties agree that this Article 30 and expedited procedural rules, that's for an appendix, this and that, shall take precedence over any contrary terms of the arbitration agreement. So you have this party who may be pretty ignorant about all this. They've made a specific arbitration agreement, included certain features in there, but if they're not compatible with this procedure here, they will be ignored. It becomes even more specific if you go to that appendix. Here you see the $2 million threshold. It specifically says, when it comes to the composition of the tribunal or constitution, that the court may, notwithstanding any contrary provision of the arbitration agreement, appoint a sole arbitrator. So again, going back to my example, you've got this dispute arising, you've got a clause where you specifically agree with the other side that we're going to have three arbitrators, because perhaps you felt it important that you got to nominate an arbitrator of your choice. $2 million may not be a big uh, dispute for major companies, but if you're a smaller business, $2 million can be quite a large amount. And maybe you think, no, I want, if that's happening, I want to be sure that I can rely on this tribunal to understand the facts and this particular industry we're in, so I want to nominate an arbitrator of my choice. It's an important thing for me. Then you have the dispute arising, $1.9 million. You get the question from the Secretariat. The court is contemplating to nominate a sole arbitrator because you are now in the expedited procedural rules. What's your comment? And then your opposing party says, we're fine with that. Because if both parties agree, the ICC are not going to do it. But if only one party disagrees, as a general rule, they will say, well, the expedited rules will apply. We will appoint a sole arbitrator. They may not, I mean, the court, and especially the secretary, I should say, uh, they're clever people, they get a feel for the situation, but the general rule is, in order to get efficiency out of these rules, is that you then, in that situation, go for the sole arbitrator. Now, if that party who wanted to nominate its own arbitrator then end up losing the arbitration, that party may well feel a little bit dissatisfied, perhaps believing that it could have turned out differently had he or she only got the opportunity to do what the arbitration agreement said, which is to nominate an arbitrator of its choice. That party may be more prone to challenge the award and perhaps try to resist enforcement, and it may be helped. Because if you go to the New York Convention, and if you look at Article 5.1.D, it says, recognition and enforcement of the award may be refused when, and here comes in the D clause, the composition of the arbitral authority, that is the arbitral tribunal, was not in accordance with the agreement of the parties. With these three examples, I've tried to illustrate to you what I perceive to be a growing tendency in international commercial arbitration to be overly focused on efficiency, sometimes at the expense of other important principles and values, be it general fairness and long-term risk management, as in my example of the due process paranoia debate, be it a common global 
framework and an adversarial process, as in the example of the Prague rules, albeit party autonomy, as in the example of the ICC expedited procedure. By no means, and I want to be clear here, am I saying that efficiency is unimportant. On the contrary, it's likely vital to the long-term survival of international commercial arbitration. However, it always needs to be tempered by other considerations, including those principles and values that I've mentioned. Just because those principles and values are less tangible and cannot easily be measured and compared doesn't mean that we won't sorely miss them if, over time, we allow them to become devalued or eroded in the name of efficiency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, and thank you very much, Robin. Um, I'm very pleased um, to be here on behalf of the Dean of, the, uh, of Sydney Law School, Professor Joanne Riley, uh, to give the vote of thanks on behalf of uh, the University of Sydney uh, for this evening's lecture. Uh, we've heard a, a very um, interesting and thought-provoking lecture on uh, one of these issues, which is a, a real uh, practical problem which arises on a daily basis before arbitral tribunals all around the world, and it's one that arbitrators, not only arbitrators but parties, also have to grapple with uh, where to strike the balance in this very difficult tension um, between this desire for efficiency and the uh, decision that parties have made when en entering into their contracts perhaps some years ago about the method in by which they'll resolve any disputes that arise, and one of the factors in making that decision would be perhaps that arbitration could be seen as more efficient and uh, a faster way of getting to a result. But then that has to be counterbalanced, as we've heard uh, from Robin, with the need to afford the parties due process and procedural fairness on a whole range of issues that are going to arrive over the course of that journey of the dispute resolution, uh, resolution proceeding. And one aspect that we've heard uh, about in this, uh, in this difficult tension is that the right of the parties to have a, a full opportunity of presenting their case. This is the language of Article 18 of the Model Law, that the parties have a full opportunity, quote unquote, and that those two words could really perhaps be seen as an antidote to this uh, need for speed and this rush for efficiency, uh, p perhaps seemingly at all costs. Now that, of course, raises a question, what is a full opportunity? How long is a piece of string? Does it mean that the, uh, are the, the parties' counsel are allowed to uh, present oral submissions for days and days, or only for an hour and a half, or for half a day for their opening statement and their closing submissions? This is a very difficult issue, one that uh, arises in every case, but it's, it was uh, somewhat heartening to hear Robin describe the full opportunity as really being a reasonable opportunity. It's a phrase he used uh, repeatedly uh, throughout the lecture because that is the way that Australia has interpreted uh, the, the, uh, the obligation on the tribunal to give the parties a full opportunity in the Australia's International Arbitration Act. Section 18C says that a full opportunity in Article 18 of the Model Law means a reasonable opportunity. But this is just one example of the many issues that we've heard about this evening uh, that tribunals have to grapple with on a, uh, on a daily basis and we are grateful uh, to Robin for having elucidated these issues um, on, on, uh, in, in his lecture this evening. Another difficulty arises in investor state arbitration where one party may be able to act more swiftly, more nimbly as regards collecting documents, as regards making decisions about the strategic course of the arbitration, but the other, being a state, uh, will have to take a lot longer to decide to make decisions about how to present its case it will have to take a lot, lot longer to find the documents when it's presented with the Redfern schedule by the private investor because there may be documents in various departments scattered around the country. And this is another issue uh, where there is a, a, a real difficulty in investor state arbitration where states might find the argument is more open to them that they haven't had this reasonable opportunity because of the constraints they find themselves under in having to deal with so many different government agencies. But this was a really interesting lecture, I think a very timely lecture, and it's one that's given all of us a lot of food for thought uh, as we go about our work in international arbitration. I'd like to thank Clayton Newts um, and Steve O'Reilly for hosting this evening's lecture. I'd also like to thank those from Clayton Newts who aren't able to be here this evening, Frank Bannon and Doug Jones, uh, who have both been very important and instrumental in the uh, development of this lecture series. 
Uh, we at the University of Sydney are very pleased to have this partnership with Clayton Newts, uh, which is now in its 17th year, and we look forward to continuing that uh, in the years to come. I'd also like to thank uh, the Federal Court of Australia, the Chief Justice and the Judges of the Federal Court of Australia for allowing us to use this, uh, this, uh, this room for this evening's lecture. Uh, last but not least, I'd like to thank you all for coming to be, and for being an important part of the conversation and the important issues that have been discussed this evening. Uh, and I now have the pleasure of inviting you to join uh, us all for refreshments uh, just outside. Thank you very much. <laughs>